Jermaine, thank you so much for taking time to come on to my YouTube channel. It really means a lot. And I thoroughly enjoyed your book, The Humanity Archive. Uh, congratulations on the book. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm just thrilled with the response to the book and just all the support and the love of uh, people who are buying it and learning from it and being enriched by these uh, narratives and stories that have been overlooked in history. Yeah, the the idea of the Humanity Archive, I knew about it before it was a book. Uh, so when did this idea as a whole for you, this idea of the Humanity Archive start? Yeah, it started back when I was a teenager. Uh, I, w I was going to school in middle school and, um, you know, we were learning these stories, black history stories. And, you know, we only got about five figures, the Rosa Parks's and Frederick Douglass's and George Washington Carver's. And I just kind of had this inclination that there was more to the story. So I didn't live very far from the library. So I rode my bike over there and asked the librarian where the black history section was and just started reading books. And then I started to see this discrepancy between you know, what I was learning on my own versus what I was learning in school. And not only that, though, you know, I started with Black history, but, you know, this library just being this kind of democratic place where everybody's stories are represented. I started going then once I felt comfortable and like I really had a grasp on my own history, learning history of other cultures. And that's kind of where I started to see similarities uh, and this whole idea of humanity kind of came to mind. And, uh, you know, that's the ethos behind everything I do. And that's why I have this quote behind me by uh, Terence, uh, a formerly enslaved man from 165 BCE, a Roman playwright uh, after he was enslaved. He said, I am human and nothing human is alien to me. So, uh, you know, that kind of brings me to this idea of the commonalities that we have, even if we are talking about differences, which I do in the book. I talk about race and class and, uh, you know, uh, the frictions between people, but always kind of circling back around to this idea of humanity and our common bonds. Mm -hmm. You had an amazing uh, set of lines all throughout this, phrases that I underlined. I, I underline a lot and make notes in, in, in the uh, margins of books and stuff. I'm, I'm, I, I, I do it in pencil now instead of pen. I used to do it in pen, and then I was like, no, I better do it in pencil in case yeah. I, I need to rephrase this. Sometimes have, I buy two copies of books. One, I mean, if it's a book I really like, I'll have one just kind of like the display <laughs> book, and then I'll have the other one that's all scribbled in and <laughs> has the margin, that, uh, uh, written, uh, the writing in the margins and everything. <laughs> I hear you. I'm 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 pretty much the same way. Uh, but you have in the prologue uh, a couple lines that I really really enjoyed and really struck home for me, especially in this day and age. And we're going to go over that in a little bit. Uh, in the book, you say education is to freedom what the sun is to life. To learn is to survive. And without a knowledge of history, a part of you is effectively dead. Uh, how did that time in the library become that ray of sunshine on you and your your understanding of the past yeah i think uh the history is so powerful you know uh as james baldwin said we we're trapped in history history is trapped in us so whether that be our personal histories uh you know that's why ancestry.com is so popular because people want to know their origins people want to know where they came from people want to go back to their roots so uh for me that was a kind of uh going back to my own roots you know in that library and just um finding my identity in history, you know, whenever you're in school and they have this very narrow view of black history and blackness and what that is, and, you know, just kind of uh, a truncated down to or abbreviated to the civil rights movement and slavery, well, you're kind of thinking to yourself, well, there's got to be more to it than this, you know, uh, that that can't just be all of what black people have been and what black people are. So then, you know, going through those libraries and learning all about the black inventors and empires and, um, you know, it really kind of flew in the face of this internalized idea of black inferiority that's been uh, passed around for so long, for so many centuries. that I think I internalized myself, which I talk about that personal journey in the book. It kind of lifted me out of that. And uh, history is just powerful in that way because it is our narratives, it is our stories, and it really hits us in the heart and soul, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know, speaking for myself personally, uh, and, and I've never talked about this, but I think because of the things I've read, uh, not only in your book, but but in others, and, and speaking of Baldwin and, and others, when we come to February every year and we come to Black History Month, and me as a creator, I sometimes want to put stuff up that uh, I haven't before and such. But then I question myself, am I pandering by mm -hmm. doing this? 
am I doing this in good faith or am I doing this because I need to check the box? And I yeah. think other creators sometimes feel that way in a way, but they're afraid to say it. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we talk about things like Black History Month or uh, and, and other months, like we have Women's History Month and we have Native American History Month, what is that line where it's like, uh, you know, are you doing this in good faith or are you doing it to pander? Because we don't want to be like, you know, a major supermarket chain or someone who's just yeah. pandering for that. Absolutely. We as historians, how how should we look at that in a, in a way to say, OK, we're doing this in good faith or you can see that as in good faith? I think it just depends on, I mean, what people are doing, you know, beyond February. Uh, you know, what are you doing for the rest of the year? You know, is this the only time that you're uh, highlighting black stories or, or any type of marginal histories that rarely get talked about? I think that's when you might have the question of whether you're checking the box if this is the only time that you're highlighting those things because, um, you know, there's definitely that trap of uh, the, the commercialization of black history, right? To where we're seeing Target with, the you know, I am black history t-shirts and hoodies and dolls and you know, there, there's definitely that part of it, but I think, uh, you know, some of that's the question everybody has asked themselves internally. Like, are you doing it for the right reasons? Are you really trying to uplift these stories? And, uh, you know, a lot of times that's a question that, that people are going to have to ask for themselves and answer for themselves uh, in their work and, and continuously trying to uh, uplift, overlook histories. Mm -hmm. What kind of stories do you talk about in, on your podcast? Because you have a, a tremendous podcast as well on top of all the other work you've done. Yeah, so I, I wanted my first book to kind of focus on uh, Black history, um, you know, just because it was a very personal book for me. And, you know, just starting with my journey in the library and uh, my journey as someone, as a scholar, and just really putting my experiences into this book. But actually, the Humanity Archive, I mean, the reason I didn't call it the Black History Archive is because, you know, I was able to just round out my knowledge in the library and studying various cultures, um, you know, from all over the world. So for me, it's about finding those stories across humanity that are overlooked uh, or bringing my unique perspective to different stories. So the podcast was uh, more of a universal in endeavor in that way, um, the underlying theme being humanity and connectedness and then uh, overlooked history. And then the book is definitely uh, tied into that. But the, the broader theme of what I do is, you know, the Humanity Archive and, and searching for overlooked stories throughout uh, human history. What kind of stories did you look for to put into the book, Jermaine? Um, I think for me, it was about uh, what book would I have wanted to read whenever I was in school that I didn't get? Um, what stories that I want to, you know, what is the, the, the core of Black history, you know, uh, and for me, it was about this tied back to that humanity, the overlooking of black humanity, the overlooking of black tears, the overlooking of black joy, the overlooking of black pain. I wanted to really tie that emotional aspect uh, to my work because, you know, I remember learning about the, the Great Depression, for instance, and uh, you had all the, uh, you know, jobless white people standing in soup lines in the book, they had those uh, pictures that you saw in the book. And so you, you learn empathy in that way of like, this was the greatest disaster of American history, but I didn't really see that same uh, empathy for black people in the history books. Uh, I didn't see the the breadth and the depth and the uh, inner lives of black people being told in that way connected. Cause you know, we learn history in a way of facts and you know, the stock market crash or, you know, an election of a president, but you know, I wanted to tell those really deep narratives of what black people not only uh what has happened to black people like anti-black history is what i call it but also what black people have done uh the the brilliance the inventiveness uh the contributions to america uh, and to the world mm -hmm. you talk in the book uh, you connect something in a book i never thought about and that is that uh the idea of race and the idea of racism uh can be traced back to medieval Absolutely. europe uh, could you explain that for my audience who may never have heard something like that before, that race and racism can be traced back to medieval Europe and, and so forth? Yeah, there was an edict in uh, Toledo, Spain uh, that came out and it was actually racism. Well, the first legalized instance of racism was actually against uh, Jews. Um, you know, this is during the time of the Black Death and everybody was blaming Jewish people for this because uh, 
they were isolated and segregated in their uh, communities and kind of ostracized uh, during that time. And uh, yeah, so they came out with these laws saying that if you have, uh, you know, Jewish blood, then you know, we're going to legally oppress you and segregate you. So that, that's, again, the, the theme of humanity allows, allows me then to uh, look at similar themes throughout history and, and kind of tie it together, you know, the experience of Jewish people um, duplicating itself in America to, uh, you know, black people, you know, the, the term ghetto originated, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the Jewish community and, you know, that's been applied to now the black community. So, you know, definitely human behavior um, on a broader scale, you know, can definitely, you could see it no matter what history you study, right? And you can start making connections in that way, even though we all have our unique experiences. So I'm, you know, with that perspective, I'm able to zoom in and out. And that's kind of how I wanted to, you know, show this racism, where it began, who it began with, and show how that was duplicated for Black people. So, uh, you know, that's, again, always tying Black history to a larger human history, the particular with the universal. Mm -hmm. We're seeing that a lot more now uh, on you know, on shirts or in other things that our creators are making about black history as American history yeah. and, and such, bringing the two together. That's kind of the uh, premise of what you wish to accomplish as well, right? Where we're making yeah, this yeah. part of this understanding on, on a grander scale. That was uh, really in the tradition of, of Carter G. Woodson. He was the, uh, you know, the, deemed the father of black history. And he said something that, that really hit me. And I really think that, uh, that was the underlying theme of the book too, is he said, oh, we should not study black history, we should study black people in history. Mm -hmm. So then that's a, that's a big distinction that uh, you know a lot of people aren't, don't grasp, I don't think, because to study black history is to keep it segregated. It's when you go in the bookstore and black history is on another shelf, it's you know gonna keep it segregated in universities and African-American studies electives. But what he was saying, and what, what we're still not at in 2023, why we still need black history month is because black history uh, has not been incorporated into the whole of the American narrative. And I think that's purposeful because people, you know, if you talk about black history, you have to talk about race. You know, a lot of people within black history were, uh, you know, fighting for freedom. They were fighting for equality. So all that's going to have to be incorporated then into the American story. So to keep it segregated and separated, you know, you can kind of deal with that over there. You can keep that over there and kind of keep this American, uh, this pristine American narrative intact as long as you keep black history separated from that. Hmm. We've discussed libraries and, and bookstores and, and such here. We just touched on those. What about in your travels going to historical sites or uh, house museums or whatever the case may be? What have you seen out there that really was a thing where you're like, wow, this could be interpreted a different way that would be more constructive than the way we're doing it now mm. in 2023 or yeah or, or you know 2020s whatever the case may be well right here in my own city uh there were uh a slave pens right here in downtown louisville kentucky um and they have a marker for them you know they wanted to highlight that and uh you know the historical society then put these markers up and so louisville i mean it was it was a hub and they, these slaves came here uh and were shipped down south from Louisville, uh, a Midwestern city. And uh, so there were uh, quite a few slave firms here uh, in the hundreds. And so they worded this historical marker in that these uh, uh, these slavers were, uh, what do they say, that they were shunned by the community and ostracized by the community. But I'm thinking that there's hundreds of these firms. How exactly were they shunned by the community? So that's where the whitewashing comes in. It's not so much uh, overtly uh, racist language anymore as it was before, you know, black people are inferior, all, all this stuff. It's still the sugar coating and the sanitizing and, you know, the, the whitewashing of the history, I think is what we're seeing a lot now. Um, of course, we have the, the kind of history wars is what people call them now in terms of what's taught, but um, in terms of how it's interpreted, it's definitely whitewashed in that way of downplaying uh, atrocity and, and, you know, the things that have been done to black people throughout history, for sure, and other groups as well. Mm -hmm. I remember having arguments with uh, people I grew up with uh, because it seemed like they were more willing to defend the enslaver than a person like John Brown. Mm -hmm. And I was always like, wait, there, this is also white resistance to the idea yeah. of enslavement. Why are you not 
you know, talking about freedom in this way, saying, hey, yeah. we have an ally, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Up to. I wrote and, about another gentleman in Tennessee. I, I, his name slips me right now, but he was, he was pretty much the John Brown of Tennessee, right? This guy mm -hmm. who uh, railed against the enslaved. So there's examples that could be, even in the South, there's examples of, you know, white people who rose up against it and, you know, forming interracial coalitions, even during the Civil War. And we don't hear any of that, do we? <laughs> you know, right. it's the Confederate narrative, but, uh, you know, People don't, uh, it's, I guess it's that kind of heritage and, you know, people are just so, that's again, history is so felt, right? People are emotionally tied to this uh, kind of lost cause Confederacy story, even though you have examples of better human beings who are white, even in the South and, and elsewhere who could be looked to, but they're just not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's amazing too, because we, we talked about ancestry uh, before and I actually did my ancestry work couple of years worth of building the tree and doing all those other things. And I found an ancestor in the 18th century in North Carolina who was an enslaver. Mm. And he's the only person in my family who's like south of Maryland. And yeah. when I found that, my idea of my family history totally changed. And I felt yeah. like, wow, okay, now I have to think about how far, how far we've come from my family to me mm -hmm. being here and he wouldn't like me, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, I'm often w worried about that because far too many times people wish to defend that because it is their family. Yeah. It's painful, and, right? It's painful. It's painful. To go back yeah. And I, I actually felt get, dirty. Get right yeah. 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 Uh, but some people don't, and I never understood that, but I'm, so I went into history, Jermaine, and I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> yeah. But there's definitely psychology tied to history because, again, it's, it's the stories we tell ourselves. It's our identity. It's, um, you know, definitely the identity part is, um, you know, most people go back into history to find something to be proud of. I think nobody's going back to be like, you know, my uh, great great grandfather was a murderer or, you know, a slave owner or anything like that. You're hoping maybe to find a doctor or two or maybe somebody who uh, was a, did something great. And then you find that and you, you got to reconcile that somehow. And if you, you can defend it or you can, you know, be real with yourself and be like, okay, this happened. How do I, how does that fit, you know, with my, my circumstances mm -hmm. now and my family history? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure um, that was an uh, eye opening moment for you. I'm sure, I'm sure you didn't expect to find that. No. No, I did not expect to find that. And it was, uh, like you say, it was an eye opening moment. And it was a moment where I say that, you know, my family or myself has come far, but at the same yeah. time, realizing that there's still further to go. You know, mm -hmm. it's not saying it's perfect. It's not saying there aren't these uh, prejudices still in my family or in other families, but it's it's a step forward to say yeah we're not for that guy <laughs> yeah know, that's the and you see that too um the, the wrestling right I, I think of uh you know the the legacy of thomas jefferson that's people gets the most upset whenever i bring that up and you know his black descendants uh, i've talked about them and how you know uh thomas jefferson estate knew about the black descendants before but of course you know it took to like 1998 with the dna evidence kind of uh, was like hey you know you can't deny this any longer and even now you know they're, they're not really reconciling that history how you would like to see in terms of uh you know honesty about it um you know the the, the monumental uplifting of thomas jefferson reaches to the heavens uh and, and for me I, I don't think you know jefferson you know he's a brilliant man i mean he did all these things you know that uh can be considered great but you know uh on this other end though <clears throat> you know you have this monster side to him too and i think that we have to look at both of that but people just only want to keep this monumental you know history and um i think now what we're seeing is more critical history you know to, to try to balance this this overly monumental history that, that america loves to portray and uh i think that's where you're kind of getting these battles between like the 1619 and the 1776 where on the one hand, you have the 1776, which is the, you know, it's Washington in the uh, uh, Capitol Rotunda lifted up to the heavens as a god. Basically, like that's how they painted him in there. And the Thomas Jefferson, this, this great American founder and these stories. But then you have other people on the 1619 side. They're the critical side of like, no, we got to look at this other side, too. And that's where you see these history wars and clashes of, uh, you know, the question is going to become like, how does America reconcile? these two narratives, can America reconcile these two narratives? I think that dichotomy speaks to so much of uh, the division that we see in the, in the nation, for sure. Mm -hmm. As a historian, bringing up those two different projects, uh, how do you navigate 
those mm -hmm. kinds of things to make sure that you bring as many people into the, the truth of the matter, but at the same time, understanding that there are going to be some people who just won't want to listen. Yeah, that's true. That's the hard, I mean, you know, there's going to be people, it's like, uh, you know, you're planting seeds and, and sometimes the seeds are going to get carried off by the wind. Sometimes the, the, the seed is going to sprout and, and grow. Right. So I, I look at what I do. Um, I think I'll probably take a bit more balanced approach to where I can, you know, I, I feel like I'm a little more free and ebbing and flowing, uh, you know, with this framework of humanity that I have to where I think sometimes people can get caught up in a uh, blinded even about the, the critical history where they're just like just kind of railing against everything and just tear it all apart. Um, then on the other hand, people can just be so blinded by like, you know, Jefferson or Washington, there was just such great figures, you can't say anything bad about them or, you know, I'm, I, it's, I'm gonna do ad hominem personal attacks against you. How dare you talk about these founders that way? So um, for me, it's less dogmatic and it's more like, you know, I wanna talk about the critical side, but I also don't want to downplay, you know, some of the things that I can learn from these people as well, you know, uh, I mean, George Washington could have made himself King Washington and decided not to do that. So there's aspects of his reality and life that I could pull from and learn from also at the same time, uh, you know, talking about some of the horrible things that he did uh, at the same time. So uh, I think that's where I try to be. And I, but I know there's going to be people on, you know, I'm not going to be able to get to, but I just hope as I sprinkle these seeds that some of them take root in, uh, in people's minds and, and grow. Mm -hmm. One of those ways that you discuss in the book is having a toolkit at your disposal, a history toolkit. Yeah. Uh, every Everyone should have this toolkit. And, and I confess for the longest time, I didn't have one piece of this toolkit because my local library wasn't the best one for the newest yeah. stuff. But uh, please go over that toolkit for everyone who's either watching or listening, because I think these are very fundamental things for us to be understanding of who we are and who, what the world is around us. Yeah. So in my book, before I really go too deep in the book, because of course, everybody, every historian, you know, have to study the historian as much as the history because everybody mm -hmm. has their own personal thoughts and biases and uh, preconceived notions and everything else. But you, the educator in me really wanted to show people, okay, just this is how I study history as a framework, you know, just the, as a, an unbiased way as I can tell you, um, do these things, right? So first and foremost, you have to read and you have to read widely. That's the first thing that I, I put in there. Um, you know, historians, it, it's called historiography, you know, for historians, you get a bunch of books and you, uh, you know, uh, synthesize the information, you draw your own conclusions, you're not just reading one book. So I think that's actually, we teach kids all wrong, we're teaching them from one book, we should just, throw them everything and then just kind of guide them through it, you know, read the critical history from 1619, read the patriotic history from, you know, people uplifting America, read communist history or socialist or, uh, you know, economic history, read all these histories across the board and then, you know, draw your own conclusions from that. I think we're failing students by not teaching them how to do that. And it'd probably be a lot more exciting too in that way. So, uh, you know, that was the first framework. And then we talked about uh, the monumental and the critical history, and that comes from uh, Nietzsche, the philosopher. He uh, had this uh, uh, writing that he did was called The Uses and Abuses of History, to where he kind of laid out that framework of, uh, you know, if you get too you get too caught up in this monumental side, that could be a disaster. If you get too caught up in the critical side, that could be a disaster. And then some people just love history so much they, you know, want to dress up in old clothes that was or, or, you know, just the artifacts and that part of history, he's basically warning us, don't get caught in either one of these frameworks. We need to be able to reconcile and kind of ebb and flow between them uh, and bring balance to our study of history unless it becomes too dogmatic. So that was the second part of the framework. Uh, and then the third part was just having more empathy, you know, when we read history and trying to connect to the people and their narratives. And then the final part was uh, this idea of Sankofa, which comes from the Akan people of West Africa, and uh, it means reaching back for the gems of history, you know, bringing the best of the past forward to see how we can apply these ideas and concepts to enrich our own lives and better our own lives, you know, standing on the backs of our ancestors, so to speak, uh, and the things that they did and trying to move forward into a better future. Mm -hmm. So all those things came together for this kind of framework of how I approach history. And I, I really wanted to share that as an educator with uh, everybody who read the book. Yeah, I greatly admire that because, uh, Far too often in the field of history, 
uh, too many see it as a competition when in fact we need to be empathizing uh, with each other and working together to, you know, allow these narratives to get out there such as yours and, and, and whatever I may bring to the table or someone else may bring to the table, having these kinds of discussions uh, in a civil manner and not coming with a negative viewpoint of each other or, or whatever the case may be, uh, preconceived notions. Having these discussions is a huge thing for all of us. It doesn't matter what society you're from. It's a, it's a Do you think bad. we've lost the art of, uh, of civil debate? I was kind of reading a little mm -hmm. bit on that the other day. And, uh, you know, because I think that understanding, enlightenment, and of course, there's always going to be people that you know, you're going to be so far apart from the, the, the chasm and, and the gap is just too wide to uh, find anything in common. But I, I really get the sense that most of us are way closer together than uh, you know, were made to believe through the media and everything. And if we only would have these conversations or debates, then, you know, we might find some common ground. But I, I, would, I would love to know your thoughts on that. Oh, well, uh, Jermaine's turning it on me. He's giving me, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready to field a question. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah. I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. Uh, I think that, uh, like you say, some things have been blown out of proportion as far as the separation between people. Now, I think we are closer than we actually say, uh, we are. Um, I also think that there are, and always will be people who come to us with bad faith intentions. Yeah, and it is up to us to say, this isn't, uh, we can't make a generality out of this. This mm -hmm. isn't everybody with this particular idea of the past, uh, say the civil war or the American revolution or whatever the case may be. Uh, this is just this one person. And, uh, you know, I had a preacher one time say, uh, John, your problem is that you wake up in the morning and you think that you're this bright, shiny apple and everyone's going to want to pick you. But in fact, some people just like bananas more. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I never realized that, you know, you just put it in a, a, a small perspective. So there will be people who always come to you with these kind of bad faith arguments. They have Absolutely. they have their idea. They're set in it. This is it. And they will argue with you because they love to argue. Mm -hmm. uh, and they love to like be a bully sometimes. I've, I've experienced yeah. that myself. But I really think that there are genuinely good people out there who uh, want to learn and who sometimes are just afraid to be uncomfortable or afraid to realize they're wrong about yeah. something major. And that might be a, a human thing, but... Uh, it's something that we have to try to work through together instead of yelling at each other. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Because I was I was heavily involved years ago in uh, you know this lost cause or idea, and uh, that's what I learned in school. That's what was taught to me on the street. And when I actually read the documents and and got involved in uh, primary source research and stuff, you had that moment where you're like, I've been wrong. Yeah. And I've been lied to. Now, what am I going to do about it? Am I mm -hmm. going to keep the lie going or am I going to try to be better? And I think some people sometimes have, have come to different conclusions about what to do with that, but they still have uh, they still have goodness in them. And I think we can really help. But maybe I'm just an optimist. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do think, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's people that you're it, it might do more harm than good even to try to engage with those people yeah. because they're they're they don't have any good intentions and uh you know somebody's asked me that before for sure you know with my message of humanity and trying to find common bonds even while highlighting you know the things that that are tearing us apart and trying to be honest about even some of the things that we need to do to to rectify uh you know whether i'm talking about uh race or, or class or any of these types of things but um you know people were like you know what where, where do you where does the buck stop, Jeremy? You know, at what point do you back off and say, you know, it's going to do more harm trying to uh, find connection with these people who are actively, you know, uh, you know, railing against you or, or what you're about or who you are, you know, the history that you teach. Um, you know, so I think you, you bring up a good point about the, the good faith argument, the bad argument to be able to recognize if someone is coming in good faith and actually has an argument to make versus they're just you know, have these uh, these prejudicial ideas or, you know, just very entrenched emotions uh, about, you know, whatever mm -hmm. they're trying to argue, but it's really, you know, they're arguing, but it's no argument behind it. It's just all emotion, mm -hmm. um, you know, and negativity and 
you know, a lot of times hatred even. And I think that's where you back off. So you always have to be aware and be able to distinguish kind of what's what in order to know whether to engage or not, you know, because there's definitely some energy out there of, uh, you know, people want to keep things exactly how they are and they don't want to debate or any of that. They, they want to keep things how they've always been. And, uh, you know, they're not going to hear anything you have to say. Mm -hmm. Speaking of engagement, Jermaine, how do you want readers to engage with your book? Uh, well, part one of that, I think, is um, I really I mean, and it's a sweeping book, but uh, I kind of wanted it to be a jump off point where if you only read one book on black history, this will take you on all the offshoots that you might need to go. So I really try to quote as many other scholars as I can. And, um, you know, very, I try to really highlight, you know, other works other than just mine so that people can get a comprehensive view of black history, not only from my book, but by being able to go like, oh man, Jermaine mentioned this book. I want to go check that out on this particular subject that maybe he didn't go uh as deep into as i would have liked to um so i wanted it to be kind of a comprehensive book in that way um so that's the takeaway i wanted and really just to be able to uh you know see black humanity you know uh in the words of frederick Douglass, you know um you know a smile has no nationality a tear has no uh no no uh ethnicity right so i mean i, I want you to be able to see those things within black people that i don't think are very you know highlighted or uh attuned to so much, um, you know, the inner lives of black people, um, the feelings. So I, I use a lot of uh, narrative in the book, a lot of, uh, you know, primary uh, source quotes in the book so that you can hear exactly what people felt, heard, thought, saw in relation to uh, the broader things that I talk about, whether that's, you know, civil rights, slavery, whether that's empire, whether that's, um, you know, just somebody just trying to get by and support their family, uh, you know, whether that be the Civil War and what people saw during that, Black people, because they're talking about their feelings and emotions. And I think that's how we connect with each other is through those stories. Mm -hmm. Who's one person that you bring up in the book who you would love to have dinner with? Um, I'm going to have to go with Frederick Douglass, I, I, you know, one of the, the greatest Americans in my mind. And, um, you know, it's he's one of those people in history. It's like... Um, bumping into your neighbor at the grocery store, you know, you're always going to end up bumping into him somewhere up to a certain point in history. Uh, you know, he just keeps popping up over and over again because he was such a prominent figure during that time. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just from his moral courage uh, that he had and, you know, his brilliance, I, I would love to pick his brain over dinner for sure. So he'd be my number one for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking you might say that, but I wasn't sure because he was, he was going to be my choice. I've yeah. Always I've always been fascinated by Douglas and uh, him saying that you just need to agitate once in a while mm -hmm. and, and get people, you know, to try to understand some things that you've gone through, through maybe agitating the, the right people to agitate. And, yep. uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a great admirer of, of Douglas. Absolutely. Um, but what is, uh, what is next for you, Jermaine? Because you've done, you've done so much and you continue to do so much. Uh, you continue to do the podcast and, and other things, and, and now you've got this uh, wonderful book out. Other than speaking about the book and, and, and such, what are you looking forward to doing to build on top of this foundation that you've created? Uh, I think I just want to keep going. You know, uh, I want to keep building out my archive. I mean, I uh, really try to bring a, a balance of, you know, I want to make history accessible. So I, I really try to always balance, you know, as many free resources I can in addition to things like books and courses and, um, mm -hmm. you know, other ways that people can support me. But I really just want a, uh, an accessible archive, a community of lifelong learners and, uh, you know, history lovers or people who might feel like they didn't get what they would have hoped to get in terms of overlooked history. They can come to the humanity archive and, you know, uh, all these things that I have to offer and find community and, People want to engage in dialogue about these overlooked stories and, uh, you know, just continue in their learning, uh, you know, young or old. Um, I'm sure there's going to be another book coming down down the line. Uh, there's already been some some kind of talks about that. So, uh, you know, just all of these things being part of just kind of building out the humanity archive. Uh, I, I really want to see this as a not really a brand, so to speak, but just a, a community. Um, and something that is ongoing and long term and kind of a legacy of uh, telling the stories of humanity to enrich our lives and transform the world. So, uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to building on what I've already done. 
Well, you and I have that in common. We have a legacy project to to keep going. We want to leave something behind, you know, yeah. in that way for for our colleagues and friends and future historians mm -hmm. uh, out there. I'm a big admirer of the Mandy Archive because uh, you you put uh, a lot of stories of Black history on there and, and, and Black personalities, but you also have a lot for uh, women and Native Americans. And uh, I think you know we can we can really learn a lot from what you are producing on paper and, and digitally, Jermaine. And uh, I've been really honored to have you on my YouTube channel and to talk with me today about the book and, and everything else that you've been doing over the last few years. It really means a lot that you're here, my friend. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I greatly appreciate it. And uh, you yeah, have great respect for you and your work as well. And I'm you know, glad to be here.